sit in good company End all the harm ere I ever done Alas, it was to none but me It's perfect Oh, oh. I know we're all exhausted But we gotta push just a little bit more Send you! We have to go in there. And joy be hand to hand. This prison is ours. Someone's coming. Rick's gotten us a lot further than I ever thought he would. Two. Find them hiding in the woods. At the gates in five minutes. Secure? Your cell block is. What about the rest of the prison? What is this place? Stay tight, whole formation. Anyone breaks ranks, we could all go down. Anyone runs off, they could get mistaken for a walker. We want our weapons. Two against the world, that's long odds. Go back, go back, Paul. go back! Keep moving! Let's go this way! Hey, you can't keep us here. We haven't done anything! Open the door! You're not prisoners here, you're guests. Welcome to Woodbury. Hard to believe you ladies lasted so long out there. I don't trust him. You're not a killer, and I know that. All we do is run. What you have here, you're sitting pretty at the end of the world. How many of you escaped? There were more. I was separated from the rest of them. Do whatever you gotta do to keep this group safe. We're going out there and we're taking back what's ours. This prison. We took it. It's ours. We spilled blood. Come on! We gotta get out of here. Who the hell are you? see you out here, anywhere near our people, I'll kill you. Now, how's about a big hug for your old pal, Murr? Huh? <laughs> Far off in the distance, somewhere you can see. Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to Geek Fest France. My name is Carlos Perone, and joining me today, I have Steve Avona. Say hi, Steve. Hey, Carlos. And I also have Steve Lox. Hello, everyone. Steve Lox will be joining us a little later with some comments. And today's discussion is going to be the return of The Walking Dead. This is supposed to be season three. And we got a little bit of a preview, actually, when we attended New York Comic Con. Not only were did, did most of the cast show up to talk about the new season, but they introduced two new characters that we kind of knew were coming. We got to meet in person, you know, right there on the stage, the actor who plays the governor and the actress who plays Michonne. We got a little bit of a preview of Michonne last season, you know, the last couple of scenes of the last episode of last season. But the governor was a completely new character that we have now uh, to deal with. And just to kind of wrap things up from the previous season, you know, our heroes had escaped the farm, which was overrun by zombies and it looked as if they were getting very close to a prison that prominently plays a central role this season but in the process one of the good guys separates from the group you know in the mayhem of the the, the post fighting of the farm and she meets up with michonne a brand new character who's a katana sword wielding yeah. uh, heroine <laughs> 
And those are, like I said before, big, big characters. Now, Steve, tell us a little bit about how we start off and also the, the time difference, apparently, between season two and season three from the first episode of season three that we watched a couple of weeks ago. Well, aren't we talking now about seven, eight months from the end of season two? Yeah, that was pretty surprising when I heard it. I'm like, wow, they yeah. can really jump that far? That was a big jump. And I thought that was kind of interesting because at the last shot of season two, the camera pans up. And weren't we seeing the prison at the end of season two that in, during you know that shot? We sure were. And I don't know, to me, it looked like it was kind of closer than we thought it was. I right. mean, it was kind of like over a hill or over a mountain or something. Exactly. So I kind of thought that the, you know, I was a little surprised at the time differential, but you know, whatever. So the big thing here is Andrea has been separated from the group and she has hooked up with Michonne. And Rick is still leading the survivors from the farm, and they eventually find the prison, which both of these storylines have been eagerly anticipated by fans of the comic, both the prison and the Woodbury storyline, because it was going to introduce several new characters like Michonne and the governor. So I think this season was really eagerly anticipated by a lot of people, including myself, because I was very open about my disdain for season two and i was really looking forward to the opening of season three right and i remember that one of the biggest complaints not only yourself but a lot of people had about the second season was that it slowed down quite a bit right the visit to the farm took almost the entire season yeah and a lot of people were kind of like well let's get on with it let's get on with the action and you know you did have some action every now and then and a big climactic end you know the end of season two right but this season I mean, it looks like they're just turning it up to 11 in terms of how crazy they are going and they're moving Absolutely. with characters. I mean, just from the second that, okay, we have this prison that you know the characters want to get into and, and they think this might be a good place to hold up in. Right. Them working their way into the prison, and this takes about, uh, I would say about two episodes, mm -hmm. to, not only to work their way into and to secure a building for themselves, which in the process, Herschel gets wounded right. and we get to witness a very grotesque amputation take place <laughs> yes. in order to save his life. We meet, apparently, some prisoners in the prison that have managed to kind of barricade themselves somewhere and stay safe for a while. What do you think about that? Well, you know, you also have to remember when I talk about Walking Dead, I've never read the comic. So I have really nothing to go on except what friends have told me about certain storylines. But I also know that the series does not follow the comic chapter in verse. So um, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect. I think the interesting thing here has been the transformation of Rick into this badass leader who at the end of season two was basically like, I'm in charge. You don't like it. Here's the door. And, you know, really once he disposed of Shane and he just, you know, I mean, people were kind of afraid of him. And you're just getting the sense now that he's the top dog. He's not to be messed with. And the way that Andrew Lincoln has been playing him has been so, so intense Yes. that the performance, as opposed to, like I said, season two, it was all the soap opera kind of drama with Shane and Laurie and all that love triangle nonsense. And you really get the sense now that he's just stepped up and he's not going to be questioned by anybody and he's really taken control you saw at the end of season two how scared they were of him and how he was just dead set on keeping them alive, but doing it his way. Right. So it's no surprise that when they meet the prisoners, that he is not interested in having them join the group. He doesn't trust them. It takes a lot of convincing of the other people in Rick's group to let them help them in the slightest way. Right. And the other thing we have to keep in mind is that Rick's transformation didn't happen, you know, in a vacuum. Right. It is as a result of Lori in a way, because of the fact that on one hand, she's kind of noticing that in the previous season that Shane was becoming more dangerous and more dangerous and more or less attacked her a couple of times in some shape or manner, but that she's telling this to Rick and she's urging him to act a certain way. And then when he acts a certain way, she kind of 
admonishes him for it. Right. So it's a very conflicting dynamic that you have. You know, he's trying to please his wife <laughs> in a way. In a way. But she's like, you know, well, you took it too far or, or you, you acted the wrong way or how could you do this in front of your son? You know, that kind of stuff. Exactly. And I think by the end of season two, he's like, you know what? You know, it's almost like that typical husband, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing with the <laughs> wife. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> F with a it. touch of apocalyptic zombies. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, there's always the zombies eating the flesh in the background. But it still mirrors, you know, that's the brilliance of the show. And I know other members of our group have pointed this out. It's not about the zombies. It's about the people. And it mirrors the dynamics of everyday life in a way, just the fact that it's the apocalypse. But he's just like, you know what? I'm through trying to please you. And I'm going to do things my way. And, you know, I think that, and I guess we're, I'm sure we're going to get to this in the conversation. I honestly feel like he was pushed to this by Lori. Yes. And Lori, once she did it or sort of accomplished whatever she was setting out to accomplish, didn't like what she found and was kind of regretting it in a way. No, you're right. You might be absolutely right. Now, let's keep in mind also, and, and we kind of predicted this and we kind of talked about it before. When Dale died last season, that was the end of, you know, civilization as we knew it. Because <laughs> Dale was the guy that was always, you know, trying to look at things from the other perspective. And, right. you know, everybody's innocent and they're proven guilty. And that whole morality that doesn't seem to no longer function anymore in this right. world. No morality and no democracy. Right. And now, granted, Rick is not exactly, you know, a barbarian in terms of you know, a dictator in terms of how ruthless he is, but he does seem to be going a little bit the other way now in what we've seen. Right. Now, as we said before, we, you know, we got in the prison, we met these prisoners and off the bat, after a couple of run-ins with some of these prisoners who, especially one of them that was challenging a Rick left and right, there was not too much of a debate as far as Rick was concerned. He just took the guy out, period. That, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, you know, that type of development, you expect it to last maybe two, three episodes before your main character decides to take action. I mean, look at Shane. It took two seasons <laughs> to act on Shane. Right. It took him one episode to act on this particular prisoner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was saying to myself, I'm like, oh, is he going to take this guy out or is he going to let him go? And it just, it's true to the character that Rick has become that he was right. like, you know what? He's a threat and he's going to be gone. Right. Not only him, but there was another prisoner that kind of turned on them and he just kind of chased him out into the yard and left him out there. Didn't kill him, but he left him out there to basically to fight his way through Zombieville. Right. Which was as good as killing him. Now let's hop over to the other side because there is an, a parallel story taking place right now, which is what happened to Andrea. Right. And because, you know, like we said before, the, the story jumped seven months, she's apparently been on the run with Michonne. Right. And Michonne is pretty much carrying her because even Andrea herself seems to be uh, sick with the flu or something. She's mm -hmm. got some kind of bug. Right. That is, she, she's kind of weak and Michonne is kind of showing her around and, and hiding her from everybody. And we get to meet Michonne's pets, which we kind of saw a quick flash mm -hmm. at the end of last season. Then apparently these are two zombies that are chained whose arms have been removed and apparently lower jaw has been removed. Yes. This way they are kind of harmless in terms of not being able to bite you. But they also are meant to keep other zombies off her scent. Is that correct? Right. It apparently masks their scent with the zombie scent and they use them as pack mules. Right. To carry all their crap around. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's not a bad idea. Right. Which they kind of did a little bit in the first season when Rick... And Glenn cover themselves up in gut, blood guts. and guts to kind of walk through the streets until the rain comes. But they're quickly found by a group of some kind of weapon-wielding group that turns out to be the governor's group. And yes. they're brought into the town of Woodbury, which is a fortified town, more or less, that is run by this particular character of the governor. Now, what were your first impressions of the governor? Well, again... Even though I hadn't read the comic, I have so many friends who are fans of the comic that, you know, you can't help but know of big characters like Michonne and the governor. So I was anticipating his arrival in the show. And I knew that he was obviously not everything he was cracked up to be or everything that he was portraying and that he was going to be, I guess, the big bad of season three. And he's played by David Morrissey, who's a, an excellent British actor 
who genre fans might know from. He didn't exactly play Doctor Who. He was in a Doctor Who Christmas special, sort of as a Doctor Who impersonator. But that's where ah, uh, and that's where I initially knew him from, and I and I liked him. And and he's also been on some British dramas and cop shows and things like that. So he has a pretty good pedigree. I got the sense that we would be slowly peeling back the layers on the governor. And honestly, I I really want to believe that had I not known anything about him prior, that I would have gotten the sense that there was something off about him, that he was definitely hiding something and that he had created this idyllic paradise. But this is walking dead land. You know that (laughs) it's not it can't all be wine and roses. There's got to be, you know, some serious shit going on. And we found out in the first five or six episodes that it's really crazy town. He's the mayor of crazy town. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's cool because in a way, you know, from the beginning of one of those, I think it was the second or third episode, probably a third episode, you get the point of view of a helicopter crew, a military helicopter crew buzzing around. And all of a sudden they make a crash landing and they get overrun. And that's how the governor's crew also runs into them. Right. And the fact that, you know, they save one pilot or or a crew member from that helicopter crew. But then by the end of the episode, you know, the governor is, uh, you know, relaxing and apparently he's done with some woman (laughs) in in some shape or form Mm -hmm. (laughs) in bed. And then he goes to this other room to relax and he's got uh, apparently a, a collection of what appears to be heads. Heads. In aquariums. Like, 20 heads floating in aquariums and you're like what the hell is this all about and the top of the aquarium is the guy that they had saved uh who apparently at some point we got to see this they encounter the rest of the military group and they massacre them all right which i think that goes back to the background of the character and this is something i guess you'll learn at a certain point but i during the convention going back to new york comic-con they asked the actor uh, marcy david marcy they asked him, you know, how did you do any research on this character? You know, where, where do you get background for a character like this? And he says that he read the Rise of the Governor book that oh. Robert Kirkman had put out the year before. So he uses that as the background for the character as far as his own acting technique, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I read the book and I understand where this all comes from. As a matter of fact, on I think the follow up episode where we get to learn a little more about the governor you get to see him he seems to have some zombie little girl that he's taking care of but is that his daughter well it's hard to say because it depends on are they following this particular book or are they following their own trail here okay according to the comic or are they following the comic which i don't know i purposely have not read the comic past the prison because i didn't want to know anything about it but according to the book The little girl is not his daughter, it's his niece, but he at some point adopts the persona of his brother Oh, because he ends up actually killing his own brother. Okay. And his brother had his daughter turned into a zombie and he was keeping her like hidden from everybody because he was completely nuts. And at some point in this book, he not only kills his own brother, but he takes his persona. He starts to call himself Phil, Phil Blake, but his name is not Phil Blake. His name is Brian. Okay. And he apparently starts taking care of this zombie girl and not only taking care of her, but feeding her. He's chopping people up and feeding it to her. So he's a twisted, twisted individual, but I don't know if they're going to go in that direction in the show. Isn't the novel canon as far as the TV universe is concerned? I don't know. I think it might be canon as far as the comic is concerned. Okay. So I'm not sure. That's why I'm saying I don't know what direction they're going with these books. Are the books canon to the TV show or the comic? So we'll see. We'll see what direction they go. Okay. In the books also, because I'm also now reading The Road to Woodbury, which is It's basically a follow-up to the first book. Yeah. And it's the beginning of these type of gladiatorial contests that Mm -hmm. they have to entertain people. So we'll see what direction that goes because they haven't even begun (laughs) to, to explore this whole thing. And I remember friend of mine you know used to tell me about oh wait till you get to the prison and wait till you meet the governor and wait till you see what the governor makes everybody do and this and that i'm like oh my god what's this all about and i actually thought that the governor unless the stories will converge at some point and they will i'm sure i thought the governor was the guy who ran the prison as so did i so did i uh, but apparently 
at least not yet or not at all. Who knows? I didn't know those were two separate things. Right. But we'll see when we get to it. But mm -hmm. anyway, going back to the prison again, there was an episode that was completely, completely shocking, you know, getting away from Woodbury now, where we get to see two main characters completely exit the show. Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, you know, you knew all along one of the dangling plot threads of the show was Laurie's pregnancy. And was it Shane's baby? Was it Rick's baby? And that was never completely resolved. But the fact of the matter was is she was having this child. And I think one of the reasons of, you know, them sort of making camp in the prison was this would be some place where, you know, that could take place where she could give birth in addition to just being you know a safe place to hold up for a while and I was curious as to how that was going to play out it seemed as though they were setting it up you know there was that one scene where was it Carol who was looking at the zombie woman trying to figure out how to deliver a baby or right she's trying to practice uh, a c-section if necessary right so I was sort of gearing myself up for that because I knew that that was going to be an intense scene no matter what but I was not ready for the fact that, spoiler alert to everybody, I'm sure has seen it, that Laurie wasn't going to make it. So we had, in this episode, the very shocking death of Laurie. And it was also interesting because she had sort of, in the prior episode, made a kind of peace with Rick. And I had wondered if that, at the time was going to signal sort of a new direction in their relationship in terms of, you know, would they sort of move on from all the animosity that had occurred between them and start over? Obviously, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and the other death was, I mean, you call him a main character, but I never really thought of him as much of a main character or anything. But I mean, uh, but I like the way he went out. You had T-Dog. He met his maker in the, in the same episode. And I also, you know, for a character who really never did much or said much he went out in a blaze of glory I, I thought that they gave him a, a good exit right and they kind of left us hanging with the fate of carol here yes even though by the time we air this we might most likely will know what her fate was right but yeah that was unexpected i never expected to, them to try to get rid of this character now what's ironic is the fact that and it plays to rick how he handles these two deaths especially his wife of course how in a way you could kind of say it's his fault because the reason why they had this last internal outbreak in the prison was because that prisoner that he threw out, that he didn't kill, he just threw them out into the yard, apparently came back and started opening up gates and letting some of these zombies in. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were separated within the prison and he couldn't protect her, it was due because of that. It all stemmed from that incident. Right. Now, let's talk about specifically Lori, the fact that she's apparently in labor. Mm -hmm. And she has to deliver the baby and she has no access to Medical Herschel or facility. Rick or, oh, or mostly right, anybody. Yeah. She's completely separate with one of Herschel's daughters and with Carl. Right. Tell us a little bit about how that whole thing went down. <laughs> well, uh, it becomes apparent that she's not going to be able to deliver the baby normally, that it's going to have to be a C-section. And it's just, who is it, Maggie that is the one who's going to deliver the baby? Herschel's daughter. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right, Maggie. Yes. And Carl is with them. And it becomes apparent that she's going to have to do a C-section. And the C-section is, it's going to kill her. There's no two ways about it. Sarah Wayne Callies, who plays Laurie, has this incredibly intense scene with her son, Carl. Right. She has to kind of say goodbye to him. Say goodbye to him and tell him that he has to, you know, help his father and protect the baby and step up. And, you know, I'm not a parent. I would imagine that that scene just about killed anybody who has children or, you know, who's been through the experience of childbirth, and, <laughs> you know, and it really was, for my money, it was the most intense scene of the show. Yeah. That's the type of scene that if you've never seen this show, and this is the first episode you watch, and you're squeamish, or if you're a little, you know what, I'm not into this sort of thing, you will never watch the show no. again. Yeah. Because but I'm this not just... scene was gut-wrenching, yeah. emotionally gut-wrenching. Exactly. It wasn't just the gore, which I'm kind of desensitized to, uh, and I think a lot of us in our little group of friends are also... When we see that kind of stuff, it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. You know, you know, you're not grossed out by it. But it was the emotion of the scene. And that also plays to the strengths of the show. Uh, you know, every couple of episodes, you seem to have some kind of a scene like that where, you know, something just 
terrible and gut wrenching is, is happening, and the actors. They're such a great group of actors. They play it so beautifully, and she was great, and Carl was great. Well, let's talk about Carl. Not only does she die while childbirth, because obviously she's bleeding out because of the C-section without any anesthetics or any real medical support, mm -hmm. but then they all kind of realize that she's going to turn in a few minutes oh, or yeah. in a few hours, and Carl decides that he's going to be the one to take care of it. And Which makes this character, who's already getting very kind of battle hardened, into oh boy, this kid is gonna have so many issues. Yeah. Well, you know, it goes to the new world that they're living in. You know, uh, as much as they try and try and try to keep things together and keep some semblance of civilization, I mean, it's all kind of going out the window. So for this kid, who's I guess about twelve or thirteen, he's already put down Shane. Now he's got to put down, well, his mother's gone and he knows she's going to come back and he's got to put a bullet in her after she's just delivered his baby sister. You know, it just doesn't get much nuttier and more intense. And I don't know, I'm losing my words here. I, I can't right. imagine what, it's just a whole new dynamic. It's a whole new civilization. Yes. I would say as intense and as wonderfully acted as that whole sequence was, I think what really, to me, is the best acting of that particular episode was Rick's reaction afterwards. Oh, definitely. When he's outside and realizes that Laurie's not walking out and somebody's holding a baby so he knows exactly what happened, his reaction in his face and in his physical, you know, he's like on the floor. He's like, he's completely in pieces and he just runs into that prison. Right, but what it's also worth mentioning in the midst of of Rick's sort of breakdown at the end, the camera is also on Carl, and you're seeing he's just kind of stone faced. Oh, yeah. And he knows what he just did, and he's keeping it together, even though he's the one that, you know, put down his mother. Yeah. You know, I would have to think that it's a real turning point for him as well. I have a feeling, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Rick is going to descend into kind of madness, and that is, I'm sure, coming. But I'm wondering how much Carl is going to have to step up. We'll see. Now, again, going back a little bit. From here, we jumped back to, they, they seem to be going back and forth, which makes sense, you know, to Woodbury and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we're getting to the point now where Andrea and Michonne, especially Michonne, knows that something's not right here. And she wants to get the hell out of there. And eventually she does. She just walks out of there. And we're all kind of like saying, oh, shoot, is somebody going to try to hurt her or shoot her or something? But they don't. They seem to let her leave. And Andrea stays behind. And... All of a sudden, they have a big, what appears to be a party happening or something. Right. And at the end of the show, you have a demonstration almost, because it's not a real fight between Merrill, who is part of the governor's crew now with his, we forgot to mention, his bayonet arm that he has. Yeah, oh, Merrill, And, and yeah. you know he's dying to use that on, he wants to get back to his old group to, for some payback. And another one of the governor's guys, and they're having this kind of fight in a some kind of an enclosure uh, stadium type of setting yeah, some sort of like mini arena yeah and they have all these zombies around them in chains who have had apparently their teeth removed because the governor has this guy who's like a doctor scientist who's apparently experimenting we don't know what experiments he's doing and it's, it's a weird weird setting there where these guys are fighting with each other and if they get too close to the edge they could be attacked but the governor's like oh don't worry about it I, you know we took their teeth out so they can't really hurt anybody mm -hmm. so and that's where andrea realizes that wait a minute this guy's a little nuts because she was kind of starting to fall for him a yeah little bit. there was a lot of flirting going on so Again, we're developing more how crazy this Woodbury town is getting. I mean, we still don't know what the hell is the deal with the heads. The, the heads are still floating somewhere in his yeah. room. But we do go back to the prison again at some point, and Rick makes it apparently all the way. As he's kind of slashing and gashing his way through the prison, any zombies that are left, he's taking care of them. He makes it all the way to the room where that, it looks like a boiler room where Laurie died, and he finds on the floor the bullet. That right. he, I assume that's the bullet that, that Carl, Carl used. used. Yeah. And he also finds a dead zombie on the floor with like a bloated belly. And I'm not sure what that meant. Right. Are we the, to assume that, that this zombie kind of wandered in there and ate her? 
Well, that's you see now that seems to have stirred up a little mini controversy, and even amongst my friends, and uh, I'm of the opinion, and I've read different articles already that state that that was the zombie that ate Lori. You know, basically. See, my problem with that is that first of all, these guys when they eat somebody, there's something left. They don't eat bones or anything. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I mean it's just that her stomach was all distended, and it looked like she really had you know chowed down. So uh, yeah, I, so I'm not entirely convinced about that. And nobody said anything about, you know, in the meantime, you know, time has passed. So we went in there and got the body out and but at least got it out of there. But I don't about, know if there's enough time. Think about what happened. I mean, Maggie was there. Maggie didn't see Carl shoot. No, but she was outside the room. Yeah. So I guess it's possible. But I mean, for a show like Walking Dead, like to me, that would be really cheap if there was like a lorry zombie or something like that that oh yeah like you're saying what if he didn't shoot her <laughs> right like what if he just shot in the air and supposedly you know his mother you know gets yeah. up as a zombie i mean that's her only possible fate is to come back as a zombie and that's sort of a thankless i mean with shane it was right there in the moment right but right. with Lori, you know, it kind of cheapens the scene, the beautiful scene between her and Carl. And, you know, just to see her one last time as a zombie and what's going to happen? They're going to have to put her down. I mean, there's no But at cure. the same time, I'm a little confused also because, like I said, it didn't seem to me like the zombie could just completely devour a person yeah. like from head to toe. Yeah. They showed some blood on the floor, but they didn't. There's usually something left. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Again, I, I think also to, I mean, it's bad enough, but I mean, what were they going to show? Like Lori guts or like a Lori head or, you know, part of her, you know, it just to me, like, is it possible that other zombies could have gotten to her as well? Maybe. I don't know. Again, we're going to have to wait and see because it seemed a little, I don't know. It, it's just too much. How yeah. much can these people take? I know. Yeah. But no, I'm of the opinion that that was it, that we're never going to see her again. And I would be kind of disappointed and I would be sort of let down if they pulled a stunt like that. Well, sooner or later, they're going to have to talk about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but overall, I'm very pleased in the direction that this show is going so far and how fast it's moving. Absolutely. This is, I mean, for all the bitching that I did about season two... This is the complete opposite. It's light years, better than season two, and, and sort of almost on a par with season one. There are so many things that I'm sort of anticipating with excitement. I can't wait for Merle and Daryl to be reunited. Yeah, sooner or later, those two got to meet. That's going to be awesome. And just other moments that, you know, I believe that the two storylines are going to collide. And when they do collide, it's going to be huge. Yeah. Well, let's jump over now to Steve, who's going to tell us a little bit about his feelings on what he's seen so far, because I know that he's been watching the show religiously, just like us. And let's see uh, what Steve has to say. Okay. All right. We're here with the other Steve, who's going to tell us a little bit about his impressions of what we've seen so far. And like I said before, not only are we going to talk about the beginning of the season, which again, because we're dealing with cable, these seasons are shorter about 14, 15, I think maybe even 16 episodes because it's The Walking Dead. Usually some of these cable shows only go about 12, but I think The Walking Dead is up to 16 episodes a season now. And as of now, they've already aired half of the season. They're taking their winter break, which they do every year, and they're coming back, I believe, in February. But for now, they've actually aired eight episodes. So let's talk a little bit about your perspective of the beginning of the season, and let's move forward all the way to the end of this halfway point, all the way up to episode number eight. So tell me what you thought of how this season started in terms of the speed and the pace and the actual development that we saw, as opposed to last season that moved at a different pace. Well, much has been said about last season and about the challenges that they had from a budgetary standpoint that really you know, leached into the creative and the production approach and that they were kind of relegated to the farm location to save on costs. So you had nowhere to go but up. And I think that they really accommodated what the fans were looking for and that they had everybody back on the move. They upped the ante with, you know, not only the gross out factor, but just the action. It's so much faster paced now because everyone is moving. Even when they're in one particular location, they, they seem to be moving all the time. And it does yeah. help to progress the, you know, the storyline, but so much more tension, less exposition, more action, which is fantastic. Now, the highlights of the first couple of episodes, obviously, is the actual 
arrival and taking over of the prison, but there were certain key moments that we are brought into. And the story itself seemed to have branched in two directions. One is the prison, the other one is the governor in Woodbury. What are your impressions of the governor so far, you know, about the first couple of episodes? I mean, they're obviously trying to portray him as a, I don't want to say a good guy, but they're trying to show his lighter side, if you will, and his darker side kind of sneaking in through little by little. Well, before we talk about Woodbury and about the governor, Mm -hmm. I think what's a great development is how, you know, the big reveal at the end of season two was everybody's infected. It's just a matter of time before they start to change. And there are a number of factors that could cause that to happen. So now when they introduce different groups of people, you're left to wonder, what do they know about the outbreak? Right. What do they know about the sickness? Because every time they run into each other, they have a different you know, way of referring to the zombies. You know, Some call them walkers, some call them whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, now you have this knowledge that, you know what? Everybody's sick. And right. it seems as if the Rick group is more in the know than most of the people that they come into contact with. Right. But the other thing is that it doesn't take a super smart scientific community to figure it out. In other words, if you happen to have somebody who drops dead in your group and turns, you know, you make that connection. But I guess just by coincidence or just by dumb luck, some groups don't experience that. So they never make that connection. And they still think that the only way for this to happen is to be bitten, you know, or something like that. But I guess little by little, certain people realize that, hey, look, uh, you know, the graves are popping and people are walking out of them. And, you know, grandpa just dropped dead and nobody touched him. And all of a sudden he's turning on you. So they they'll make that connection. But it is interesting that, yes, some groups have that knowledge. And I wonder how important that knowledge is in terms of, I mean, obviously, if if you're not aware of it and you all of a sudden something happens, you could get turned. Right. You, know, you can get bit and you don't even know it. You think you're safe. Right. Well, what gives me some pause is you think about Woodbury and the governor and they have this scientific aspect going on and that they're running these tests on people. Yet in the mid-season finale, when Milton and Andrea are watching Uh, Mr. Coleman turn, Milton has yet to see that occur. Right. So, I mean, it's understandable he is dying of natural causes in that it seems that it's been somewhat of a peaceful transition to Woodbury as a civilization. But wouldn't you think that they would know or they would have seen it already up until this point as to what it looks like when somebody turns? That's a little strange. Even, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, even when the governor uses as an excuse for those heads that he keeps, Mm -hmm. That it's, you know, it's it's just a way to prepare yourself for what's outside these walls. And it's like, I don't know. I don't a- exactly believe any of that. I mean... No, I don't believe it at all. But at the same time, it's like, why would he allow Milton to run these tests, these experiments? Is it just a way of keeping Milton quiet and entertained? No, I think the primary reason is because of Penny, because of the governor's daughter, because he is looking for a cure for his daughter. Right. And that's his sole purpose. That's the reason why he is doing all the things that he is doing because he believes that there's a way that he can change her back or that she can be cured. So, And again, that goes back to his backstory, which we talked about earlier and we talked about also with our other Stephen. That is that we don't know which background they're going to use for the governor. Because it's a TV show, it's different than the comic. Will they follow the comic's background? which I don't know what it is, if there even is one in the comic, but I do know there is a book background to the governor, which who knows if they're going to ever go in that direction. We'll see. But let's go back to the story itself in terms Mm -hmm. of the season. We have the Woodbury and we have the prison. Tell me about the highlights of the prison as far as what you've seen, not only in the taking over of it, but the big, big shocking moment of the mid (laughs) of the first half of the first (laughs) Part of the third season, which is Lori and T-Dog. Well, even before then, I mean, you know, at the end of the season two, you have Rick. He says, okay, this is no longer a democracy. And they pick right up where they left off in season three in that he's the boss. Everybody follows him, listens to what he has to say. When they're in the prison and they come into contact with those other prisoners and, you know, Rick is just not trusting these guys rightfully so because he doesn't know who they are so he's sizing them up but when they start making their way trying to get to that boiler room Mm -hmm. and that one lead prisoner throws one of the walkers at rick and then he just misses him with a machete yeah the moment when rick kills that guy 
was amazing mm. because without hesitation, he just took that guy out and it it really to me that set the tone for what we were going to see, you know, uh in subsequent episodes. Right. So you have that combined with the fact that yes, we do lose a major character. Lordy dies in childbirth and to add insult to injury for her son, Carl to have to be the one to take her out so that she doesn't turn. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. I mean, the level of acting in that particular episode yeah. was off the charts and Andrew Lincoln. I mean, I respected him before then, but the end of that episode, his reaction to learning that he didn't even learn it. He just knew by the looks and the, the head count of who right. was coming out of that prison that she was gone. And man, that really hit me hard, that whole episode. That's the thing I mentioned before was that the Lori Carl thing is the highlight of the episode, but Andrew Lincoln's reaction tops that even more. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't think you can get more emotional about a section of a story it's his reaction that kind of throws it over the edge. Oh, yeah. And there's so much other context to that because he had shut her out. He shut her down. And mm-hmm. she was not allowed into his life, even though she was going to be giving birth to his child, or what we believe might be his child. We still don't we know still that. Don't know for sure. Still could be Shane's kid. <laughs> but the fact that he didn't have the opportunity to make it right, and now he has this baby, right. it was just too much. Like, there's only so much that the human mind can handle. Now... As we said before, we also have Woodbury taking place while this is happening. And the way we're introduced to Woodbury is through Andrea and Michonne, which we did kind of meet Michonne for a brief second at the end of season two. We don't know too much about her background through the first couple of episodes. We kind of know that she is on the run and she is kind of carrying Andrea because Andrea is not feeling well. She's a little sick in the beginning Mm -hmm. and they stumble upon the helicopter group, the military group that crashes. Mm -hmm. And through them, they kind of meet up with the governor's group. They go to Woodbury. They get introduced to the whole thing. And little by little, we're starting to get shown little weird things about the group. They're not exactly this idyllic situation and place that you know they want you to believe it is. Mm-hmm. Michonne is very distrustful about the whole thing. Andrea is a little more willing to give them a chance. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about you know the little hints that come along the way of Something might not be right here. Well, Michelle didn't survive for as long as she did on her own without street smarts mm-hmm. and without, you know, the survival skills that it takes to do that. So, you know, the fact that when we first meet her, she has two zombie pets, armless zombie pets that can't bite you. I mean, that speaks volumes. So, you know, she doesn't trust anyone. The fact that she kind of took Andrea in under her wing To me, maybe that's a a glimmer of her, you know, wanting to connect with somebody at that particular level because ultimately she doesn't need anybody. No. But, you know, once they do get to this fortified town of Woodbury, anybody who can sense anything about people and kind of what their motives are would pick up on the fact that something just was not right here. They have this very bucolic, you know, town center and everybody's walking around and they're planting flowers and all oh, this Stepper- is great. Stefferty. <laughs> a very Stefford-esque. Um, but you do have the governor who is very strict and immediately removes them of their weapons and they have very strict rules and that they're locked into these rooms and, you know, you have to keep in mind these people have been out and about, you know, in the wild on their own. So just the hint that you're going to be held captive is enough to make you want to kill somebody. So what's interesting is how easily Andrea accepts Woodbury and the governor kind of at face value, despite everything that she's done and, you know, kind of the skills that she's learned. She should be able to see through things a little more unless we are supposed to accept that she sees these things, but she's tired, she's ignoring it. I think that part of it is her acceptance of the new normal. So despite the fact that there's all this chaos going on outside of Woodbury, they have a little sliver mm-hmm. of normalcy. And if this is what it's going to take, then that's fine. You know, a couple of episodes into them being at Woodbury, they have this chicken fight, if you will, this like battle royale between right. two of the governor's guys. And they have these zombies who are kind of on the outskirts and it's like an added level of danger. It's all for show, right? you know, according to the governor, but she kind of gets off on it. 
she's attracted to danger. Right. At first, she acts as if she's kind of repulsed by it, but then she's like, all right, you know, what are you going to do? He gives her an answer, which is kind of like a flim flammy answer. And she's like, all right, whatever, you know, go ahead, you know, do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> now, to keep in mind that the zombies that they're using to kind of taunt the contestants, they've removed their teeth, which we showed earlier that they're conducting some experiments with Milton, as we spoke earlier, and that's how it's supposed to be safer for them to be able to fight in this manner without getting bit by right. removing their teeth, right. which is some unusual things that are being shown in this season that people are doing to the zombies and using them in some shape or form. Just like you mentioned earlier, Michonne has her pets. Mm -hmm. Another purpose of the pets is that it lets them walk amongst certain groups of zombies without being detected. Right. It kind of covers their scent by the pet's scent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they don't go too much into it, but that is part of what was happening. And it is something that the governor admires to a certain degree when he first discover right. them. And Milton also is very curious as to why was it that she had them mm -hmm. to try to figure out, hmm, maybe there's a way that we can utilize that to you know, aid our own cause here. Right. But the other development that we have by coming to Woodbury is who else is at Woodbury and that's Merle. Good old Merle. And we haven't seen Merle in <laughs> quite some time. Right. We suspected that he would be coming back. I don't think anybody assumed that he was dead. Uh, but it seems that he's somewhat of a lieutenant to the governor and helping the, to... He's the right-hand man, no pun the, intended. <laughs> in helping to maintain you know, law and order uh -huh. according to the Woodbury Code. And you know, some interesting developments there as far as where his loyalties lie when, you know... We get a few episodes in, the chance of him reconnecting with his brother Daryl mm -hmm. looks to be a reality. Right, right, right. Now, as the Woodbury story continues, we find also early on that the governor, as again, as they're giving us little morsels of information about the governor, he seems to have a collection of heads floating in aquariums which is a kind of like a creepy thing, I'm sure, mm -hmm. to have. Uh, but they don't go too much into it at first in terms of what the hell is that. Like you said before, he does have these games that he plays to entertain the people uh, involving fighting, more or less pretend. He also seems to keep a fresh stock of zombies like locked up in a special room in order to either perform the experiments that need to be performed or to do some of these games. But we also find that he has what we're told or what we believe is his daughter mm -hmm. locked up in a closet who's turned into a zombie sometime in the past. And he kind of visits her and checks up on her and kind of treats her nice. But the girl just wants to kind of chew his face off. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're slowly being shown there is something really, really wrong with this guy. And eventually the whole place is something weird happening. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the whole keeping the zombie daughter locked up and trying to find a cure, to me, that's probably the most normal aspect <laughs> of the governor because what father wouldn't want to do that? You know what I mean? Like, I admire him for not accepting, you know, this plague that they're all dealing with. Yeah, but the problem is that he has her locked up in a closet and he's trying to, like, brush her hair like a normal person. And like I said, if you want to take the route of scientific hopefully medically fixing her she should be in theory in a medical area you know confined near where the doctor is the scientist and stuff like that but i don't think a lot of people know he has her locked up in there he seems to be able, doing some of these things plus keep in mind he has to feed her right so the fresh meat is coming out of somewhere mm -hmm. and you know that some people go missing every now and then and he's probably feeding them to her sure so you know, we have enough pieces in the chessboard here to know something is wrong. But at the same time, again, we're going back and forth to the prison and we're going back and forth to Woodbury. So these two stories we know sooner or later are going to intersect with each other. Mm -hmm. And as Michonne and Andrea continue to get away from each other more in terms of Andrea wanting to stay, Michonne wanting to leave, eventually Michonne says, you know, she's had enough of this. She doesn't trust anybody. She leaves. And we are at first a little reluctant to see what's going to happen because we know that the something weird's going on and the, the governor is up to no good. You know, he, he, he ordered the uh, basically the execution of the military group, mm -hmm. the uh, reserve unit in the beginning of the season. So we're like, 
he's going to just let her walk out of there, especially Merle, just going to let her walk, and he does. And you're like, okay, and she still doesn't believe they're letting her walk. So we move back to the prison, let's say again, and this is after both T-Dog gets killed, mm-hmm. which is a, a somewhat of a shock in terms of, you know, he's kind of like an important character here. And obviously the Lori being killed, mm-hmm. the childbirth, and Rick completely loses it. He you know, starts kind of like running back into the prison and you get the feeling he's just going to kind of go and kill anything in sight. Mm -hmm. We do see a scene that was a little confusing and tell me how you feel about it, where he kind of makes his way back to the, what looks like to be the boiler room where Lori had died and he runs into a dead zombie that looks like to be a dead zombie sitting on the, against the wall with kind of like a full belly. Mm -hmm. Are you under the impression that we're supposed to believe that that zombie ate Lori? Absolutely. Absolutely, because what gave it away to me was they go to a close-up of his mouth, and I think Rick actually puts his hand there and pulls a black hair out of the zombie's mouth. Because, again, if you connect the dots, he finds the spot where she died, he finds the slug that Carl put in her head. There's a blood trail that leads over to that zombie, and he has the bloated stomach. So I totally believe that he ate her. See, I was a little confused about that. And when I was talking to Steve about it, we were kind of wishy-washy about it because, in my opinion, usually when you see a zombie attack, there's usually something left. They don't, unless it's a big horde of like, you know, maybe 50 of them or something where there's nothing left. But it's if just one of them, you figure, not to get disgusting here, but there would be something left there that resembles a human body because, as far as I know, they don't eat bones, do they? No. So wouldn't there have been something left of mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. well again maybe there could have been other zombies that tapped into that you know they dragged it away who knows yeah that's maybe a... the body was like around the corner because it was you know it's kind of dark you really yeah. can't see but... i mean part of me was like is that what they mean or is that the intention and i wish i could get a straight answer out of somebody mm-hmm. i wonder if there's uh you know online or even on the show they'll ever ask the question because you know i watch the talking dead which is after the show mm-hmm. and they do ask these weird questions so but they never really got into that. So I'm, I, I wish I could confirm it just to make it even, oh, even I, worse. I, I, I would believe that that's what they were trying to tell us because then Rick really goes, oh. you know, yeah, he, he crazy. He and goes he and, starts... and, and continues. To, I mean, I didn't know there were le- zombies left in there, but yeah, he goes in there and continues to clear mm-hmm. whatever's left of them through that whole prison and gets to a point where he's basically exhausted and... A certain episode ends with he hears a phone. It's like you're like, what the hell is a phone ringing in the mm-hmm. middle of that place? Which brings us to the following episode, which is him having these conversations on the phone with different people, mm-hmm. which he doesn't recognize. And at one point, even Herschel comes in and tells him, this is not, "These phones are dead. There's nothing going on here." He's like, "No, oh, no, they're going to call back. They told me they're going to call me back." Mm-hmm. And by the end of the episode, we kind of realize that he's kind of losing it quite a bit. Oh, yeah. These phone calls are not happening. He's imagining them. And the actual people calling him are people that have apparently died Mm -hmm. during the episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I have to confirm this. I'm not entirely sure. But I think the voices are some of the actors who were in the show who died, including obviously Lori. Mm -hmm. But some previous actors, I think, were part of those voices. Mm -hmm. But I have to check that. Yeah, I'd have to go back and listen to that to find out. You know, you can probably tell who it is. Because I think she says at one point when she's telling him, she starts describing the members of the party. I think she mentions Dale's name. Uh So he's probably on there as well. He's probably one of them. He might be one of the voices. That that's hear. what that's what Kyle was telling me. My son was telling me, "Hey, I just if you look at the credits, you're going to see the names of some of these actors who right. play these." I'm like, "Are you sure?" Yeah. So I got to check it out. Mm-hmm. Now, that's what's happening at the prison. In the meantime, while Rick is losing his mind inside the prison, you know, outside Maggie and Carl. So what happens is the baby is born mm-hmm. and Lori dies. So there's no way to feed this kid. If she was alive, she could breastfeed the baby. But now they need food for the baby. She needs to eat. So they decide they're going to set out and try to find some formula right. as they've done in the past. Go foraging you know. for food. Exactly. And they send Maggie and Glenn to go look for that. So as that's happening, we kind of start intersecting different stories. Michonne is out of Woodbury and she starts to get the feeling that something's not right. 
She starts to feel like there are people watching her or something. And we then find out a little earlier that the governor sent out Merle and a couple of his henchmen Mm -hmm. to take care of her, basically, which is what we were suspecting all along, that she's not walking out of here. No, no way. You know, you got to keep in mind, the governor is very protective of what it is they have there, so they wouldn't want to let anybody leave and then give up their position. You know, they could come back with other people, they could try to overtake Woodbury, but I think that also he personally has an issue with Michonne as well because he can't figure her out, And he knows how dangerous she can be. Not necessarily that she would bring people back, Mm -hmm. but that to have somebody floating around like that out there, you know, he's the alpha dog. Mm -hmm. He's got to be the top guy. Plus the potential of her, which eventually happens, teaming up with other people. Even though she's a loner, Mm -hmm. if she teams up with other people, that's an even bigger danger for the governor and his group. So there's a confrontation between the governor's group and Michonne, and Michonne basically takes care of all of them. Mm -hmm. But she Um, is wounded. She is injured, and Merle is the only one that's left from Mm -hmm. that group. But prior to Merle being the last one standing in the the governor's group, he does tell the subordinate, the new guy, who now has this, you know, bloodlust, yeah, let's go after her. Mm -hmm. And Merle says, no, 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 she's wounded, let her go. So the young guy, you know, he asks, well, what are we going to tell the governor? We're going to say, well... We're going to tell him that she's dead. He said, well, I can't do that. I'm going to go after her. So then Merle kills him Mm -hmm. because Merle doesn't want to go after Michonne. (laughs) He knows that she could kill him. She's way more skilled than he is. So she's allowed to escape. And Merle goes back to Woodbury, basically tells the governor she's dead. Right. He's lying to him. He knows he's lying to him. The governor is a little iffy, but we get the impression that he believes what he told him. Mm -hmm. So... You got to keep that in mind when it comes to the events that happen later. Glenn and Maggie find a place to get some formula. They go inside, come out with a basket full of stuff. And from a distance, Michonne is watching them. She kind of catches up to them. Again, what are the odds that she's going to find these guys? But it happens. And as they're getting ready to leave, she's watching them. All of a sudden, Merle comes up to them and... Obviously, he doesn't know Maggie, but he recognizes Glenn. Mm -hmm. And a scuffle ensues, and he ends up taking them prisoner. Mm -hmm. And Michonne witnesses all this. And by the end of the episode, Michonne basically picks up the basket of formula and walks in the direction of the prison, which is where these guys are. Mm -hmm. Now, do we get the idea of how she found the prison? No. Because I don't know that that was necessarily mentioned by anyone at that point. Because Andrea has no knowledge of the prison. No, she doesn't know. And I don't know that Glenn and Maggie were talking about it, or even if they were loud enough so that she could hear them. You know, she Mm -hmm. was, you know, down the street behind a car. Maybe keep walking, keep going down the road and eventually... That's probably it. She just kept walking in whatever direction they were headed in, or she just got lucky. Mm -hmm. And the episode ends with Michonne arriving at the prison gate, basically. Mm Mm-hmm holding the formula, covered in what appears to be zombie blood or guts Mm -hmm. from the fight that she had in the woods. And the zombies around her are not exactly attacking her because I guess she's masking the scent, which is something that's been done before, successfully, unsuccessfully. Season one, we've seen it. Rick did it. But also around this time, right before the arrival of Michonne, we find out that Daryl locates Carol hiding in the prison. And I wasn't really surprised about that. I mean, the fact that they didn't find her body and they found her headscarf. Which basically she was saved by T-Dog. Yeah, sacrifice. T-Dog sacrificed himself to save her. Once he died, I just assumed that she would be resurfacing at some point. Which, right. It was great, you know, that he winds up finding her. Right. And they're not going to do the same thing they did with her daughter, drag on her fate for an entire no. season. <laughs> no, not at all. So we move forward now. And Michonne is in the prison. She's being questioned by Rick's group. She's a little weird because she's she's kind of reluctant to tell them everything. She doesn't mm-hmm. say, again, she doesn't mention anything about Andrea, but she does tell them that, you know, the formula came from this other guys who claim to be part of your group, which they are, right? Glenn and Maggie. And they kind of agree to let her kind of tag along and show them where they are. Mm-hmm. So... And she does tell them about the governor, about Woodbury. Right. She gives them that information, although not right away. And even after Rick kind of pressed her a bit, you know, he kind of grabbed her wound oh, yeah. and was, you know, very confrontational with her, yeah, very he's, aggressive. He's, he's not the old Rick anymore. No, that's for sure. he is not. So even though this person, you know, shows up with formula for his kid, 
he doesn't care because he doesn't trust anybody. So he's going to find out the truth. But then shortly after that, she does acquiesce and start giving some intel. I found it very unusual for her because she's such a tough character so far. And to be willing to give in to them. Granted, the assumption could be made that she understands these are good people. So she is giving in to them. Again, it seems to be against her character to give in to anybody. Well, I don't know that she's believing that they're good people. I think that she very quickly recognizes the fact that she wants to kill the governor. By going back with more people, her chances of doing that are greatly increased. So when they do get back to Woodbury, it's clear right. what she's there to do. She's helping them, but she's got her own mission. She has her own agenda. Right. So I think that in that moment, she recognizes the fact that they could have killed her in two seconds, but they want information. They care about those people that they're with as opposed to you know just throwing her in jail or you know or torturing her or what have you. So the fact that they're going to start fixing her leg, you know, maybe that let her relax just a little bit. Because again, she's been bleeding for however long it's taken for her to get there. So she's right. also probably not quite in her <laughs> right mind. You know, she almost passes out when, right. you know, right before they bring her into the gates. Mm -hmm. Now, in the meantime, in Woodbury, we have Glenn and Maggie taken prisoner. And not only is Meryl, uh, you know, interrogating and basically torturing Glenn, threatening Maggie... The governor gets in on the action, too. Mm -hmm. He goes straight to Maggie, and you get the impression that he wants her to think he's going to rape her, mm -hmm. but I don't think they take it that far unless they don't show it and she's lying about it. No, I don't think he did. I just think that... Uh, it was just a mind game. It was just a mind game. I don't think that he would hesitate to do no, that, no, no, no. but I think that you know he's a good read on people. Mm -hmm. He probably recognized the fact that, well, I could do that, but it's a waste of time. We need to focus here. Right. And he I basically to... wants one of them to turn on the other for yes. information, and eventually they do. One of them, in order to save the other, I think Maggie tells them, yeah, yes. they're, they're in the prison, the, prison. the, the rest mm -hmm. of our group is there, and blah, blah, blah. And obviously, Merrill notes that Daryl is with them because mm -hmm. you know Glenn is there, and they talked about him before. Right. So the plan at the moment is to just, okay, stay tight, keep them in the room, prisoner, let's figure out what we're going to do about this. And then we also hear from Merrill telling the governor that, you know, he could probably talk his brother into coming back, you know, mm -hmm. helping them out. And the governor's like, eh, I don't know about that. He's not too sure about it. Mm -hmm. But obviously Merrill's always backing down because he doesn't want to go up against the governor. And while all this is happening, Andrea is, again, getting closer and closer to the governor. She's not catching on to what's really happening. Mm -hmm. She seems to play along with him even more to the extent where we as we talked about earlier, she's asked by the governor to help Milton perform an experiment, which mm -hmm. is the trying to see when somebody turns without being bit. And that's the old man at the end of the episode. And if there are any echoes of who they were if before they, remember they anything. turn. Yes. Right. And they perform the experiment. The guy turns, goes right after Milton, and she has to kill the guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's not very surprised about the results because she seems to know this. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. But that's basically you know, how they wrap that up. So what you basically have by the end of this episode is two groups who are getting ready to come after each other. Mm -hmm. It's almost at the same time they're, they're like kind of moving on each other. So by the time we get to the actual mid-season finale, we have Rick's group coming in and they apparently get there before the governor's group is on its way out. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the mission is basically to get Glenn and Maggie back. So they make their way there. They, you know, they're throwing smoke grenades and creating all sorts of diversions. They find Maggie and Glenn, which... By the time they find them, they're almost dead because Merle had a, one of the zombies go after Glenn and mm -hmm. Glenn had to fight him off. And he, at one point, took off the guy's arm and attacked he, he the, fashioned, the guards. He fashioned a <laughs> shiv out of the guy's <laughs> forearm <laughs> bone, which was pretty intense. Like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so th he's able to kind of fight off the guards. And by the time they're about to get clobbered again... Rick comes in and gets them out of there. In the process of rescuing Glenn and Maggie, they lose one of the prison guards that was with part of Rick's group. Oscar. So, you you know, he's, he was kind of like a red shirt anyway. One of the convicts, yeah, he was a red shirt. But, you know, before we get into all the hubbub, for the first time you see fear in the governor because uh -huh. they're looking at the map and they're talking with Merle when they find out that they're at the prison and they're just wondering... How did they clear the prison? 
they can only imagine how many walkers were in that prison based on the number of people that they have. So you, you, group, yeah. you start to sense fear in the governor because this is an intense group that he's going to be going up against. Despite whatever artillery he has, these people know how to survive. Right. So there's a chance that he could actually, you know, come out on the losing end of this scenario. And his main concern, again, is the fact that you cannot have a group that organized living close to you. No. It's not about live, living peacefully. It's it's no, it just can't happen. You cannot have somebody as good as him or better that close to his, you know, his town. Right. So as this progresses, you also get the idea, I mean, you see it that Michonne is helping them to get through this, but she's also has another plan and tell us about that plan. Well, her plan is to essentially wait in the governor's office for him to return so that she can kill him. And while sitting there very patiently waiting for him to return, she discovers not only the governor's little floating head museum, <laughs> but she discovers his zombified daughter, Penny. Penny. Not realizing that she's a zombie at this point because right. at first she, thinks she she's actually a is she's yeah. very calm. She comes, you know, willingly to her. And, she, but her head hooded. is covered, so right. we can't see what she looks like, or she can't see at that point, thinking that the governor is just holding this child captive which I can only imagine what's going through Michonne's head at this He's point. He's not that crazy. He's not that crazy. <laughs> but she, before removing the hood, actually frees her of her chains. And then at the moment where she lifts the hood off, discovers that the kid actually is a zombie, is about to kill her when the governor walks in and essentially stops her from doing what she's going to do, starts to you know try to plead with her to not harm the child and... That ain't going to happen with Michelle. She pulls a Rick. (laughs) She pulls a Rick and she just takes that sword and just impales that kid's head, which of course sends the governor into hysterics. And he's a big guy too. So he starts going to town on Michonne. They start, you know, throwing each other around. He throws her into the tank. They're trashing the room. Heads, you know, zombie, live zombie heads (laughs) biting all over the place. That's something to keep in mind. All those heads are still alive. Yes, because the only way to kill a zombie is to kill the brain. Is to kill the brain. So, you know, they're really just going at it at that point. And to Michonne's credit, man, she is a strong chick. She grabs a shard of glass and jams it into the right, governor's eye the, uh, right before she's going to get strangled to death by him. So you think that now's the moment. She's going to do this guy in, and then who shows up? But uh, Andrea pulls a gun on Michonne. And then everybody freezes there. Everybody freezes at that moment. And you have that moment of the former friends because essentially they are former friends now because Andrea has chosen sides with the governor. But Andrea has been shooting at the intruders, not knowing it's her group because of the, all the smoke they've been popping all over all the place. All the tear gas, yeah. She then realizes, oh, wait a minute. These are my people that I'm shooting at. And, and that, you know, we don't see exactly what she does after that. Right. Michonne walks out. And Andrea kind of lets her walk out. They, mm-hmm. You know, you don't. You're assuming that hopefully they're not going to go after each other. Mm-hmm. The rest of the group kind of regroups, and they're ready to leave because they have a car hidden somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But we kind of get the hint that Daryl wants to stay because he wants to find his brother. Yes. And the group ends up leaving, and then we come back to the governor having like a post battle meeting with his town in the uh, arena area, I think it is. Uh, He's got a bandage over an eye, you know, because I guess that eye's not going to be coming back for him. And he's letting the group know that, you know, we were attacked. And he's giving this, you know, kind of heroic, you know, uh, we've been beaten speech. And, you know, I'm a humble man. And I I know when I've been beaten, I'm not going to tell you the things. You know, he's giving this great speech Mm -hmm. to kind of rile them up. And, uh, you know, he tells them, and, and but don't worry, because we caught one of them, and you bring out, and it's Daryl. Mm-hmm. I think they remove his hood or something, yep, and it's yep. Daryl. But then he also says, and by the way, the guy who let him in here is his brother Merrill. And Merrill's like, huh? You know, he's got this look. So it kind of gives you the impression that he's throwing Merrill under the bus. Mm-hmm. So the people don't get angry at him directly, but they focus all their anger on Merrill. Well, I think that he really does hold him responsible for it, because... The fact of the matter is, Michonne was not killed. Merle lied. She went, found the prison, told them about Glenn and Maggie, brought them to Woodbury. If Merle had done his job and just killed Michonne, or if he had had at least told the governor, look, she got away, then they could have sent another party out to try to get her. 
You know what I mean? So in the governor's mind, it's because of his lie. And at this point, if he's lying about that, there's no telling what he could be lying about. I don't think he really feels that Merle orchestrated this terrorist yeah, attack. But it's, I think it's that what incompetence I guess exactly, I mean. but he's using it. Yeah, he's basically going to take out all of his frustration and his anger at him by wrapping him up into this whole scenario to let him kill his brother or to let them both be killed at the same time. That is a strong possibility. That's a very strong possibility. I'm also a little leaning towards. The fact that earlier on, the governor and Merle were talking about the possibility of getting Daryl to go back to the group, to the mm-hmm. prison, and kind of betray them and get get right. a man on the inside. Right. So I'm, I'm also leaning towards the possibility that maybe this is just a plan that the governor made with Merle. Obviously, the audience doesn't see this on TV, mm-hmm. but it's like one of these things that happens that you don't, you know, they don't let you in on right away to say, listen, you're really screwed up, buddy. And I should kill you right now. Oh, he's going to cast them out. But instead, supposedly, but he's really. But instead, be a spy. let's let's arrange a scenario where your brother becomes tight with you again mm-hmm. by maybe pretending to escape together. Right. We're going to execute both of you, but you guys escape, and then he works his way back into the group. Which mm-hmm. that's a stretch because I don't see anybody like, especially the way Rick is now letting, especially after what he did to Maggie and Glenn. Yeah, no. But. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? I mean, we it's can, a, it's a, it's a, it's another theory. <laughs> it's a slight possibility. I think. Uh, because I don't think we're going to lose any of those two characters. Marilyn and Daryl are not comic book characters. They're created for the show and they're very popular characters. Mm-hmm. Rooker is a great bad guy. Mm-hmm. And Daryl. Norman Reedus. He's a, one of the most popular characters in the show. Oh, I mean, yeah. At, to the you know Rick level popular yes so I'm very reluctant to think that they're going to somehow pit them against each other and we're going to lose one of those characters yeah the other thing that was interesting was the fact that during the shootout at, as they're leaving mm-hmm. Rick is like having one of his crazy flashbacks and yes. he sees Shane, Shane. coming out of him. <laughs> yes he sees Shane Joe Bernthal returns with a beard it's and funny. spiky hair and the reason apparently was because he was shooting some other film or TV show or something so he had to keep the beard mm-hmm. what I heard on TV what that they did was that they actually instead of having to put a bald cap on him and try to f- hide the beard they said leave him the way he is make the guy who's really coming after Rick right. look like him right this way it's a reverse kind of deal that was great it works so that was a cool little thing but it does also it's very important because it's showing us that Rick is still... Oh, he's not over. He's not done with his craziness. Mentally unstable. Right. One thing we kind of left for the end here is the fact that the way this final episode, this mid-season episode begins is not so much with our main characters, but with brand new characters that we've never Mm -hmm. seen before. Mm -hmm. The whole thing apparently starts with another group with one character that's apparently very important down the line approaching some kind of building or facility or something and kind of getting in there because they're being chased by zombies. Mm-hmm. They're like, what, like four or five people in the mm-hmm. group? Mm-hmm. And tell us a little it's about- a husband, a wife, their teenage son. Right. Another woman, and then this guy and his wife, and I his, guess. <laughs> the guy with the big hammer. I've never seen such a long-handled hammer in yes, my life. me neither. I'm like, I'm sure a carpenter could tell us that's a special hammer for some special- need that I've never seen Mm -hmm. before. But from what I understand, that character's name is Tyrese. And I don't know the actor's name, but I know he used to be on The Wire. Mm -hmm. So when I saw him, I'm like, I know that guy. That guy used to be on The Wire. What's interesting about him is that he is the seeming leader of that particular group. But you have this woman who was a a hysterical influence on the whole group. I don't know if it's his wife or it's his sister or somebody that he just knows. We don't know that at this point. But boy, if I'd try to find a way to get rid of her. I mean, she's just nuts. But off the bat, the group already has an injured person that's been bitten. The father, mother, son team, the mm-hmm. mother has been bitten. So we know sooner or later she's going to turn. Yeah. And some of them are saying, do we do something now? Do we not do something now? Let's just keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm-hmm. And they find what looks like to be a building or the back of a building and they're crawling into it. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, are they going in Woodbury? Maybe that's Woodbury. Right. But, you know, what do we find? Well, the big reveal there is that the camera keeps pulling back and pulling back and pulling back, and it's the back end of the prison. So not only have we exposed a breach to the prison, which is probably why they just keep coming and coming and coming in the catacombs or in the caverns, as they call them. And how the hell do you get... I mean, it was like a whole wall collapsed or maybe exploded or maybe somebody 
blew up a something. But it's like it's a weird. Kind it was of probably hole. an explosion. You know, maybe yeah. there, there was a gas line over mm-hmm. there or what or what have you. But now you have these new people who have breached the prison and they're bringing zombies in behind them. So you wonder, well, when is that going to end? <laughs> and here we are. We have most of the men in charge are gone trying to find Glenn and Maggie and to, you know, to attack Woodbury. And you have Carl who's in charge, who has certainly proven himself to be a suitable leader Mm -hmm. in their absence, but he happens to be down following some noises. Something's going on. So he discovers these people and basically takes them back to the habitable area of the prison, the cell block that they're staying in, but locks them in their own little ante room so that they're not going to affect the Rick group. Right. Or the, the very small Rick group at the time, because most of them are out on their mission to rescue Maggie right. and Glenn. And that's basically the introduction of the group. At a certain point, they do have to kill the mother mm-hmm. because she is turning. She's going to start to turn. She's about to turn. She starts turning. So now we're left with Rick's group is on the way back. The governor is most likely ready to do a counterattack. Mm-hmm. We don't know which way Andrea is going to go. Waiting for them at the prison is their normal, what, what's left of their normal group, Herschel's daughter, Carl, Carol, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and these new people that we don't know who they are, what exactly they're up to, are they good guys, are they bad guys, we don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Granted, from the tease that we saw of what's coming in February, we already kind of know that at least the husband from that group already wants to maybe make a move on Carl and the people that are left over there. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what direction that's going to go. And the governor is really revving up to come in and Mm -hmm. counterattack. So we'll see which way that's going to go. I'm also very curious to see what happens with Michonne because when she meets up with Rick after the attack on Woodbury and they basically are upset with her because she left them alone, she went off to do something else. She comes back, she's all bloodied. And Rick says, did you do what you wanted to do? Because you didn't really help us here. She turns almost submissive and is kind of pleading with them to say, you need me, you want me to be with you. And this is a character who up until this point doesn't need anybody. So where is that coming from? Is she being upfront with them? Has she finally reached the point where she's broken down now? And needs to be with other people? Or is she... She playing some head game. Or is she playing a head game? Yeah. Just to get her sword back and just to, you know, (laughs) slip off on her own. So I'd be curious to see where that's going to go. Yeah, it's a tough one. And, you know, for the season, we only have eight more episodes because it's 16 total. So we're going to have to wait till February, unfortunately. In the meantime, I don't know if they're going to give us any more webisodes, which they've done in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, season one, they did The Bicycle Girl, right. which was an interesting little background. And, and that's how they kind of worked them, from what I understand. it was It's a way of giving you some backstory mm-hmm. to certain characters, as far as that episode went. Mm-hmm. Then during the second season, during the break, they gave us, what was it called? Cold Storage? Mm-hmm. Well, The Bicycle Girl was called Torn Apart. Mm-hmm. And the second one was cold storage. It was about a storage facility that, again, a couple of people are over, barricade themselves in. But tell us a little bit about the Bicycle Girl episode from what you remember, which was a, what, like a four or five parter, I think. Yeah, I think it was a four parts, something to that Brief. extent. Yeah. So in the first episode of season one, Rick stumbles across this female zombie who is missing the bottom portion of her body. It's essentially just her torso and her arms and her head crawling after him, trying to kill him so we're introduced to that particular character in and around this neighborhood right uh because that's kind of where everything seems to start you know rick's neighborhood or somewhere in the vicinity of rick's neighborhood because he goes back there first looking for laurie and carl so we're introduced to not only this woman but what i believe is her ex-husband yeah yeah something like that and her daughter Two kids. Kids. Or it's her son. And early on, we also see her husband's, I guess, current wife gets bitten. Right. So we know that already something has happened there. Mm -hmm. And apparently, he's keeping the corpse in the house. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, I guess the outbreak just started. Mm -hmm. So they're not sure exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And as the episodes progress, it's basically her trying to talk, I guess, her ex into, you know, we got to do something. We got to get out of here. We got to do this. We got to do that. Right. So her ex... 
winds up going into the neighbor's house. The neighbor's house to get weapons. To get weapons and finds his neighbor, who doesn't really like him, who's kind of more of a, he's like a fundamentalist type of dude. He's, right. he's, who's, who's actually played by an actor who used to be on CSI Miami. He played like the cop, the bald-headed cop who's not part of the CSI team, but he's like the real cop. We'll talk about Six Degrees of Separation. Oh. He was in the film cliffhanger with michael rooker <laughs> he played the fbi agent that is a okay. traitor okay okay who's working okay. with john lithgow okay eric quaylin his character okay yeah i think his name was taggart and the actor's name is rex lynn uh, okay that's the same guy from csi yeah, yeah. miami yeah, that's yeah. the guy okay cool he has a mustache in, in the cliffhanger. Say, didn't he have a, yeah. Yeah. And, and, wow. Yeah. So that's pretty deep. So he finds the guy. They talk. He tells them where to get some guns, mm-hmm. but he's completely like out there. The guy's apparently he already shot like his family or something. And, well, he basically, he, he's going to go upstairs. And blow his and, brains out. And, well, he's going to go upstairs. He's going to kill his two zombified children. Jeez. And then he's going to kill himself. So he essentially says to his neighbor, you know, take, take my everyone. weapons yeah. as soon as I'm gone. Have fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jeez. So the guy comes back. Now we're following him. And as this is happening, I think the corpse of his wife is starting to Re-animate. wake up mm-hmm. and the kids are hiding. And I'm not sure exactly how his ex-wife finds her way into the house and manages to get the kids out of there because he gets bitten, I believe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she basically says, all right, we got to make a run for it. She takes the two kids, gets into a car, mm-hmm. and starts driving away. And at some point, they can't drive anymore. I don't know if the car breaks down or they can't get past something or they stop for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And they're attacked by a horde of zombies. And she basically tells the kids, all right, here, take this gun, run. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stay here. Basically, she's going to divert the zombies, yeah. sacrifice herself she so the gets kids a, could run. She gets eviscerated. And and you basically see them all over her, and that's the end of her. Ironically, she's been referred to as the bicycle girl for a long time because when Rick finds her, or right before, he had commandeered a bicycle mm-hmm. that was near her. But in all reality, if you look at the story, she that wasn't her bicycle. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so it's got nothing to do with the... the it's the, totally the, random. So that was kind of cool. And I believe that episode was directed by Greg Nicotero, the webisodes. And he's been doing some of that stuff. And now during the show, he's actually directing some episodes here and there. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then season two, they did the cold storage webisodes once again. This one had less to do to any original characters other than the fact that it takes place in a self-storage facility. Some people somehow wander into it, and there's a guy in there who's kind of in charge of it, and he's kind of a little nutty. But the only connection that I could find with that episode is something to do with Rick's belongings yes. are in the storage facility. Rick apparently has a unit in this storage facility. Which is kind of weird, because there's like photo albums, like wedding albums or something. Like, why would that be there? Right, because I remember... The fact that they were talking about in the first season how, you know, people keep their out al- that's the first thing people do is they grab their, their photo albums and run. Right. So it's kind of weird. I mean, you think, well, maybe when he went into his coma, she stored away some of the stuff. But I, I don't know. That's, I mean, maybe I'm overthinking it too much. I don't know. I don't know. But that particular episode, from what you remember, give us a little bit of the plot of these people. Well, so you have this guy who's basically, it turns out that he worked at the storage facility and he locked himself in. And he just uses whatever supplies are there. He goes and raids people's units. So one guy has an extensive wine collection, and but there are certain areas that he can't access. So he's there are multiple generators accessible, but he can't get to them because uh, there's probably people floating around or he just can't get there. So he uses this guy who stumbles upon the storage facility to kind of go. They make a deal. Look, you can take the truck. He's looking to take the truck that they have back by the loading base so that he can drive away. He's trying to find his sister or something to that effect. So he says, all right, well, you got to help me turn on these generators. So he does that. And then what he winds up doing is theoretically killing him to get rid of him. But he, I guess, is not a very good shot. And it just grazes the guy. Mm-hmm. And then he comes back in. And he also finds a this prisoner prisoner this girl who used to work there that the storage facility guy was obsessed with right and he's keeping her captive i guess as his sex slave and plying her with the fact that you don't want to go out there you want to stay in here now the guy who's has control of the storage facility was also on a very similar show that had multiple groups of people 
moving in different directions. He was on Lost. He played Arnst. Yes, the science the teacher. The science teacher. Yes. You know, and the reason I think it's important is because when I watch The Walking Dead, I am continually reminded of Lost <laughs> because, you know, we were talking before about you have this other group of people with Tyrese. Yeah. You know, they could be like the tail section. You know, we have these different groups of people that move <laughs> together and then they intersect and all kinds of crazy things happen. Well, the guy who plays the good guy in this one, I believe his name is Josh Stewart, who's uh, kind of like a new flavor of the month kind of actor. I really like him. He was in uh, No Ordinary Family. Mm -hmm. He was also most recently in The Dark Knight Rises. Mm -hmm. And I also remember him, the first time I saw him was in the movie The Collector, which was a horror film from a while back mm -hmm. that all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is a pretty good actor. You'll see him. If you see his face, you'll recognize yeah. him. He shows up in a lot of television and a lot of pretty good movies every now and then. Yeah. Oh, no, I thought he was pretty good. He actually was the highlight of that series. He definitely has a certain look that it's a different look than your typical actor. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure, because I remember hearing that at the convention, New York Comic Con, when they did the panel, that the second one, the second episode series, had no connection whatsoever to our characters because they wanted to purposely be able to play in an area where it did not conflict story-wise or contradict anything that was already done. Kind of like with the Bicycle Girl in terms of they did it the first time, but they didn't want to do the second time. They wanted to keep it separate. So I hope they continue doing these in between seasons because they're kind of neat. They're nifty little you know, bonus episodes almost. The one thing I will say, and this is a criticism, the acting is not of the caliber. <laughs> the directing is not of the caliber of the actual show it feels somewhat forced well part and, of it is i think it's because they're new characters you don't know these people yeah but i i just think that because they have a limited time frame yeah. okay they're confined to the length of the webisode they're mm -hmm. trying to get a lot of information into a short period of time it feels more like they're reading a script than they're actually <laughs> you know these people like an audition it, tape it, it really <laughs> like does rehearsal? to me it feels like a glorified audition you know <laughs> And no offense to any of the actors who participated in these things, but it just feels like theater to me. <laughs> and even the look of the people that they cast, it's almost like they're very model-esque, mm. you know? So I don't know if that's done from a financial standpoint. Or, and, you know, in all fairness to them, you mentioned that Greg Nicotero directed these. You know, he's a, an effects guy. Yeah. So I'm sure that they used it as a proving ground for him to see, can he really direct one of our main episodes it's a webisode, you know, right. go ahead, have at it, dude. So, you know, no offense to anybody who worked on it. That's just my, <laughs> that's just my opinion. I would like to see a little bit more of the look and feel and the vibe because it is grounded in very serious terror, serious emotional connections to these people. I'd like to see them put a little more effort in trying to, you know, maintain that feel so that it is more of a compliment less of a supplement they also keep like you said before they keep it confined in a confined area because you can tell it's a budgetary thing mm -hmm. they're not going to give you a prison like mm -hmm. setting both these episodes have been kind of stuck in like the first one is like a house the second one it's it's a building you know it's sections of building so they you can kind of tell they're staying within an area but again, I'd rather have that than nothing. <laughs> so, True. you know, give us a little something in between seasons. Hell, I wish when they had these huge breaks like they do now, I mean, you're looking at at least two months. Yeah. Even though I think February 10th is the returning date. Mm -hmm. If there was something they could give us, but hey, what are you going to do? It's just a TV show. Well, we can go back <laughs> and watch, you know, season one. Well, season one, from what I understand, not just season one, the entire series so far is going to re-air, I think, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. Yes. So they're having one of those yep. huge marathons. Mega again. marathon, yep. yep. So uh, we can't wait until season three returns in February, and we will keep everybody updated when it returns and obviously when it ends, because these are short, short seasons. And, you know, we'll do another recap with the usual group. I would like to thank both of our Steves for contributing to today's Walking Dead recap. My pleasure. So on behalf of Steve, Steve, and myself, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And we'll see you here next time at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. I am the last Stop.